One of the biggest losses to anyone with an interest in comic book history was the passing of Steve Ditko in 2018. With him went significant insight into the early days of the comic book industry and his own unique perspective on pivotal moments, such as the creation of Spider-Man or Doctor Strange. Ditko did write a fair amount of essays where he obliquely addressed some aspects of his creative process. But these works are not well documented and difficult to obtain. Believe me, I've spent a significant amount of time trying to locate them. For the most part, Ditko was reluctant to speak about his work or his presence in the industry, so his direct views and opinions are mostly unknown. Indirectly, there are a fair amount of conclusions to be made through those essays, his correspondence, and secondhand accounts of conversations. But Ditko's own words are few and far between. Very little is in the public record. This brings us to the 1987 documentary, Masters of Comic Book Art. The host of this documentary was Harlan Ellison, and it included on-camera interviews with Will Eisner, Frank Miller, and Dave Sim, among others. It also included Steve Ditko narrating a pre-written five-and-a-half-minute piece about Mr. Ray. To give that spoken essay some background, Ditko was a student of objectivism, which for clarity's sake shouldn't be confused with the term objectivity. Objectivism is the type of philosophy developed by Ayn Rand. Rand was a novelist who explored her views in The Fountainhead, published in 1943, and her most well-known piece, Atlas Shrugged, in 1957, after which she essentially devoted her life to refining her point of view. In a nutshell, she repackaged Aristotle's teachings and added a subtext of anti-communism, which in my opinion is what led to her becoming popular. As someone who witnessed the October Revolution and whose life of privilege was destroyed when communism was enforced, Rand was well known to hate communism. So as an ex-Russian who thoroughly rejected Russian politics, she was perfectly aligned with the Red Scare paranoia of the 40s and the 50s. In other words, Rand was in the right place, stating the right agenda at the right time. As a brief summary, objectivism is a moral code. There is right and there is wrong and it's a person's moral duty to uphold the best aspects of humanity, regardless of the consequences. Anything less is not just a personal failure, but it allows wrongness to proliferate and thrive. Permitting evil is as equally distasteful as actually doing evil. So, objectivism places a burden of responsibility on those that follow Rand's teachings. As for the character, Mr. A, Ditko's interest in objectivism inspired him to create a hero that exemplified the principles he believed to be important. Mr. Ray is the personification of the most well-known objectivist axiom, A is A, which is, by the way, Rand's interpretation of Aristotle's law of identity. Mr. A debuted in 1967 within the pages of Wallywood's independent anthology comic, Wit's End. He then appeared in a variety of fanzines and underground comics throughout the late 60s and early 70s. Some of these obscure appearances were eventually compiled into Mr. A No. 1, published in 1973. Ditko continued to write, draw, and self-publish Mr. A's stories throughout the rest of his career. Even with a casual glance, one can easily determine that Mr. A is not a traditional comic book hero. He has no superpowers, nor does he have an origin story. The intrepid, morally rigorous reporter, Rex Grain, decides to put on a white mask in an all-white suit, and he starts to dole out justice with his fists and a gun. There is no inciting incident. There's no call to action. There's no training montage. Grain is simply driven by an obligation to teach others to conform to his beliefs concerning proper moral behavior. As you'll hear in the forthcoming essay, determining what's morally good requires a standard of measurement. While Ditko does define that standard slightly, he does not elaborate in detail, other than to say Mr. A is the ideal. The source audio from the documentary is okay, but it is scratchy and sometimes what Ditko says is garbled. So I thought I would transcribe that essay and read it for you. There's only two places where the audio was too distorted to be 100% accurate. I will indicate on screen when those two areas arrive. Otherwise, this is Ditko's exact words. Mr. A is based on Ayn Rand's theory of justice, Aristotle's law of identity, his definition of man, and his view of art. 
Aristotle said that art is philosophically more important than history. History tells how men did act. Art shows how men could and should act. Art creates a model, an ideal man, as a measuring standard. Without a measuring standard, nothing can be identified or judged. But everything can be measured. Disease and sicknesses are measured by a healthy organ or body. All measurement requires an appropriate standard. With it, one can measure down to atoms, up to stars, and to changes in the character of a man. Aristotle defined man as a rational animal. Rationality is a potential that has to be actualized by choice and the right-thinking method of logic applied to reason. The standard measurement for all is a rational, logical ruler. It objectively measures the rational and irrational thinking. A hero measures a man at his best in the worst situation. A hero is a man admired for his qualities or achievements and regarded as an ideal or model. Aristotle formulated the law of identity. A is A. A thing is what it is. It has a specific nature and identity. The truth cannot contradict itself and also be a lie. Mr. A's black and white card symbolizes the law of identity. It identifies the two moral potentials possible, the good and the evil. And by one's chosen action, the best or worst potential can be actualized. The card is also a symbol of justice. For Ayn Rand, justice is objectively identifying a thing for what it is and treating it accordingly. No one gets the unearned. The innocent is not penalized and the guilty is not rewarded. The card is a refusal to violate the root of justice, the law of identity by a gray compromise. A refusal to sacrifice the good to the evil, or to accept any part of the evil as a greater good. Society has its admirable people, its heroes. They are found in all professions. But hidden by the complexities of society, they are not as clearly defined, not as understood, and not as an effective model, as a story with two opposing forces of right and wrong in a dramatic presentation, revealing the character's choices and actions that identify them and lead to a just ending where the hero and the right view of life wins. Early comic book heroes were not about life as it is, but creations of how a man with a clear understanding of right and wrong and more courage chose to act, even if branded an outlaw. He dispensed a better justice than the pervading legal moral one. He was a moral avenger. He was not like everyone else, not the average, the common, or the ordinary man. He was the exceptional one, the uncommon one, the one doing what others were unwilling to do, regardless of the opposition and the consequences to himself. His success provided a better model. Through a hero, one could identify the foolish, the corrupt, and the guilty. A lead character can be better or worse than society's best model, and if a man with proven better qualities appears, then a new measuring standard for men and society is established. A hero is a model for everyone, but not everyone is willing to act at their best. Unless the man is model, blending good and bad is more comforting, easier to accept. For the self-flawed, an anti-hero provides a heroic label without the need to act better. A crooked cop, a flawed cop, is not a valid model of a good law enforcer. An anti-cop corrupts the legal good, and an anti-hero corrupts the moral good. Both corrupt ideals. Both choose the flaw over the perfect. The perfect is identified and measured by what is possible to man. A perfect bowling score, a perfect response, accepts the truth and rejects the lie. The perfect hero on principle says yes to a true identity and no to a contradictory one. Ruled by justice, he treats every identity as it deserves. He is the actualized potential for good in its purest form, a true moral measuring ruler. He is the most human and deserving of respect. Today's flawed superheroes are superior in physical strength, but common, average, ordinary in mental strength. Rich in superpowers, but bankrupt in reasoning powers. They are perfect in overcoming the flawed supervillains, saving the world, the universe, yet helpless to solve their common, ordinary, average, personal problems. It's like creating a perfectly physical adult with the reasoning limits of a six-year-old child. The creators of flawed ideals believe that no difference exists between a flawed hero and a flawed villain. Both have some good and some bad in them, so they blend into a grayness where no one is better than anyone else and where the worst can justifiably claim that he is as good, as gray, as the best. 
If it is impossible to know what is true and to do what is right, then the flaw, the worst, will be the new standard of good. Man will be defined as a flawed, anti-rational animal, and all that corrupts and harms life will be the new virtues. Like deliberately flawed eyesight, where self-blindness is the ideal, anti-life behavior will be the new standard for living. The resentment against the perfect hero is a resentment against A is A, against the integration of truth and behavior, against the non-contradictory identity of a moral ideal, against reality and life's measuring ruler, a rational moral standard. Mr. A is Ditko's example of a righteous, purposeful life. Mr. A only sees issues in black and white, good and evil, right and wrong. Within that point of view is the arrogant confidence that his moral position is the only correct position. This is his reality, and it is inflexible. Through implication, he is the ideal hero. He is a person who acts accordingly to any moral situation. This spoken essay underscores one of Ditko's well-known objections to how comics developed in the 80s and beyond. In his mind, superheroes were the best examples of mankind. They didn't commit questionable acts or feel a moral conflict over their actions. They always did their best, and, through earnest attempts, they achieved their best, even in the face of overwhelming odds. In Ditko's opinion, superheroes should not have flaws. That made them common. That made them no different than the average person. This is a consistent stance Ditko took. In fact, in a rare interview from 1968, when Ditko was asked which character represented his thoughts and beliefs, he stated, quote, The question, and Mr. A, I can't seem to separate the two. Why? They are positive characters, not negative. They stand for something. They know what they stand for and why they must make that stand. They are not just against something. Every criminal in the world is opposed to himself being robbed or murdered. But do these criminals stand for justice? Being against something isn't enough." Unquote. Originally, this began as a piece about the Rorschach series, written by Tom King and illustrated by Jorge Fornes. One of the initial questions that came to mind was, why did King fictionalize Steve Ditko using the thinly disguised stand-in William Meyerson? But in the same series, he used Frank Miller and Otto Binder by name. After some internal debate, I concluded that Miller and Binder are public figures. They've conducted interviews and done press tours to promote their material. As such, they are legally open to a certain level of satirization and scrutiny in works of fiction. The same does not apply to Steve Ditko. Notoriously, interviews with Ditko are very, very rare, and he did not live his life publicly so it might be a legal gray area to use Ditko by name, even though, at the time the series was published, Ditko had passed away. Regardless, whomever controls his estate might consider the characterization as libelous. After all, Ditko is portrayed as a quote, crazy shut-in type, unquote. Perhaps in a moment of clarity, King realized that Ditko was more complex than the portrayal he needed in the Rorschach series. Thus, he needed to be fictionalized thoroughly, this may be a generous take. I can't pretend to know the mind of King, so I have to presume the best intentions. Or at the very least, intentions that weren't openly malicious. On the surface, it's rather easy and intellectually lazy to view Ditko's opinions as diatribes of a loner outcast fighting imagined moral foes. Certainly, the views he expressed in his work were extreme by certain standards, and that could lead to certain conclusions concerning his character. But from anecdotes by people who worked with him, he was quite friendly and very open to discussion on many different topics. He certainly wasn't a misanthropic outsider. Ditko lived by his principles and let the work speak for itself. It's a rare quality that is often misunderstood, especially in this fame-obsessed society where those with limited or no talent crave attention and seek out any platform that will allow them to put themselves on display. Mediocrity, in its main forms, shallow mundanity, and juvenile edginess, seem to get the attention it doesn't deserve. In this culture, in this influencer, TikTok world, Ditko looks like a weirdo who didn't lay claim to the adulation he surely would have received had he done interviews and attended conventions. But he chose not to. For better or for worse, he quietly maintained his principles. 
In terms of Ditko's privacy, maybe Paul Levitt said it best, quote, Perhaps Ditko had a reason for keeping his private life private. Perhaps behind that simple door to his studio was a genuine gateway to other worlds that only he could open, whether by magic or science. Implausible, perhaps, but so was his work, wasn't it? Maybe the secret of Steve Ditko was just a bit more complicated than we could ever imagine. Unquote. I think that's a statement with a lot of truth. Thank you for watching or listening, whatever the case may be. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, leave a like, and a comment. Additional thanks to all my fine supporters on YouTube and Patreon. I appreciate every single one of you. Extra special thanks to John Nowyukes, Andrew Barton, Odin Ashcroft, Phil Sagan, Corey Drew, L.S. Gregor, Alexa Zernish, Brian Deaton, Johnny Lim, Steve White, Taylor Dull, and Matt Marino. You are all justified and ancient. Hey look, a playlist. Check it out for a variety of fine video products. Until next time.